Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Sports Medicine Concepts and this presentation of the Sports Emergency Care White Paper Webinar, where today we will be going through hematoma versus concussion and talking about differential diagnosis. My name is Mike Sondoma. I'll be the moderator and the presenter for today's white paper session. Um, I'm generally the, the presenter for most of the white paper sessions, although if you check out the white paper session uh, schedule, you'll notice uh, on our website that we have a couple of guest speakers this, uh, this season that I think will add greatly to our sports emergency care white paper sessions this year. So I welcome you to the first uh, program of the year. And again, remind you that we do white paper session webinars on the final Monday of every month, except Things change a little bit during the holiday season, so keep an eye on that schedule. Things change around a little. Um, but for the most part, you can count on us, 1 to 2 o'clock Eastern Time, the last Monday of every month. One thing I want to point out before we get started is that uh, all of I, I had that slide up there that showed you um, a little bit of background inf information on myself. But one thing I'd like to point out is that myself, as well as all of the other uh, program instructors here at Sports Medicine Concepts are by nature all practicing athletic trainers. So the information that we bring to you is information that we're bringing to you directly from the field of play. So although we pay homage, of course, to the peer reviewed literature and such, all of the information is coming from uh, us as athletic trainers who practice what we preach every day. And again, everything comes from uh, reflection of the peer-reviewed literature, but also our experiences and observations from the field and play. And unfortunately, all of us here at, at Sports Medicine Concepts have had the experience of dealing with the worst that athletics has to offer in terms of injury management. Um, so we have that perspective in terms of uh, being a, having worked through uh, a, an unfortunate scenario, either uh, having a positive experience with that or a negative outcome, what have you. Uh, all of us have that experience, that frame of reference, and we hope to bring that to you through the Sports Emergency Care White Paper session. I mentioned that we all bring uh, our information to you from the field of play, but we're also very evidence-based practice, and we are committed to the, all three phases of evidence-based practice in the White Paper sessions. So again, we do uh, pay particular attention to the peer-reviewed literature. All of our programming goes through systematic reviews on a regular basis, so you know we're getting our information from the peer-reviewed literature. But one of the interesting things about the way that we present our material is we have a little bit of um, expertise, if you will, that I don't think many uh, other organizations have the opportunity to offer, and that is our in two minutes or less sports emergency care program is taught throughout the entire nation on an annual basis and has been since 1995. That gives us a very unique opportunity to gather expert opinion regarding many of the sports emergency care topics we present from a multidiscipline group of medical professionals throughout the entire country. So we can decipher that expert opinion, gather it all up from many, many fields represented in the sports emergency care or sports medicine industry and bring that back to you. We also provide uh, or, or conduct many situational scenarios and simulation testing and provide opportunities for field evaluation. So it's something that we do every day uh, and that allows us to bring to you a pragmatic application of this expert opinion and the peer reviewed literature. So just a little bit of background information in terms of where we are getting what we present to you. And again, that pragmatic application, how it actually happens on Friday night. That is what we are most interested to know. Uh, it's great to, rev to, to review the literature. It's great to talk amongst other experts and find out what they think, what their opinion is. But most importantly, how is it going to go down on Friday night? And that's what we hope to bring to you. So how do you participate in today's webinar and, and all of the sports emergency care webinars? How do you interact with us? This is a, a, this, a, the screen is showing you the participation pane, which I believe is in the upper right hand corner of your computer screen. And here you'll see your participation pane uh, using that little red arrow in the upper left of that participation screen. You can open and close your panel to give you a little bit more room on your screen 
or you can open it up if you need to interact with us in any way. You can also do that by clicking on the help menu across the top. This will allow you to view, select, and test your audio if you need to. You can also view session materials, and you'll see that uh, if you look down the right-hand side of that pane uh, or panel, uh, you'll see that I have a couple of different materials lined up here for you uh, to, to help facilitate our discussion today. So those are available to you during the session uh, as well as after the session. Um, we'll be going through a lot of that stuff today, so you don't have to worry about clicking on that, but uh, you can download that later on as ancillary materials and ongoing reference material. You can uh, use the uh, participation panel for audio setup. You are by default set to use telephone, but, uh, I'm sorry, uh, to use microphone and speaker, but if you need to, if you have audio issues or anything like that and you need to switch, uh, telephone is an option. Click on the radio button that says use telephone and you'll see a drop down screen that will come up, give you a dial in information with access codes and an audio pin. This is just a sample that's being shown to you on this slide. You'll receive actual dial in information and access information when you click on that radio button for real. You can submit text questions by through the through the panel as well. If you go down a little bit, uh, you'll see in the materials section after that, you'll see a little chat. You can click on the chat log and type in any questions that you have there. Your questions will be automatically logged into the chat log. Uh, and we will do a real good job of making sure we provide appropriate answers to any questions that you type in. Following completion of today's white paper session, you will receive a follow-up email within 24 hours. And that will have the all important evaluation link. So make sure that you look for that. And please make sure that you uh, give us an evaluation uh, using that evaluation link. It's important for two reasons. Uh, one, as the program director, it's very important to me to review those evaluation links and find out if we are spot on with our objectives for the white paper sessions and using your feedback, that's how we know. Uh, it's also vital to us because it's part of our evidence-based practice certification through the Board of Certification, so we're, we're required to do that and required to provide summaries of that. So those are vital bits of information to us for multiple reasons. Uh, it's also vital to you because uh, we wait till you complete that evaluation before we issue a CE report. So uh, we'll look at that. that. That will come to you directly after the session. Complete that evaluation. It doesn't take very long. And then uh, shortly, in short order, we'll uh, send you an email that will have your CE report that is great for one category A CEU. We all know we need those coming up pretty soon at the end of the reporting period, okay? All right, so enough of the housekeeping stuff. Let's get on to our discussion at hand and why everybody logged in today. And by the way, which I appreciate you taking time out of your day to log in and join us. Uh, I know I have a very busy day lined up with uh, lots of soccer and we actually, believe it or not, are going to break heat, break heat index records here in where I am in New York State. We have a heat index warning of 103 today, uh, and that is with uh, soccer and football going on later this afternoon. Tomorrow we're supposed to have 103 as well, so uh, interesting. All right, so today we're going to turn our attention primarily to hematoma versus uh, concussion and talk specifically about differential diagnosis uh, for the two. This is one of my favorite topics um, taken directly out of our concussion management specialist um, programming, but I think it's a very valuable one, one we talked about at, uh, at length over the summer training sessions that we had. So I thought it would be appropriate to discuss this during one of the early white paper sessions uh, for the fall. Because hematomas and concussions can present very similarly, uh, especially in the early stages. So it's important for us when we're dealing with uh, a potential concussion or a potential head injury, one of the most important things that we have to do first of all, before we even start talking about concussion policy, return to play protocol, stepwise return to play, and all of that kind of stuff, before we even get to that level, we have to decide whether this is something that's gonna fall into our concussion policy and follows the typical telltale signs and symptoms of a concussion, or is this more indicative of a more significant traumatic brain injury that could result in hematoma uh, or cerebral swelling 
or any of those other conditions which would be a medical emergency resulting in rising intracranial pressure. So that's our kind of our objective for today is, is to look very critically at that and give us some criteria to help us decide whether this is a medical emergency or if this is going to fall into our concussion protocol. So our objectives then in, in trying to reach that it would be to identify rising intracranial pressure as a sign of serious head trauma. So we're going to use um, intracranial pressure as kind of our, our flag. Uh, and in doing so, we're going to look at signs and symptoms that indicate to us the early phase of intracranial pressure change. We're going to, in, in doing that, we're going to explain the body's response to rising intracranial pressure, because as you'll see in some slides here, it's important to note that the body's very good at hiding intracranial pressure changes from us, especially in the initial stage. But ironically, it's the initial stage that we need to see in order to get these athletes to the hospital and get them appropriate care. So we'll discuss those specific signs and symptoms indicative of early onset intracranial pressure change. And we're going to explain how serial, serial monitoring can help us identify those, those athletes that are at risk or are demonstrating the signs and symptoms of rising intracranial pressure in the early stages. So if we look, if we begin our discussion by taking a look at the cranial compartment, and remember you'll recall uh, from your anatomy days, the vertebral canal, uh, which is uh, kind of encased as a, as a balloon or encased in a balloon of the, made up of the dura matter, and inside the dura matter, we have the brain, we have blood, and we have cerebral spinal fluid. And the key concept here in, inside the cranial compartment is that we don't have a lot of room for either swelling of the brain itself or the introduction of, of accessory fluids, such as blood. So very quickly, when we have bleeding inside the brain or we have a bruise that's causing swelling inside the brain, it doesn't take long before vital neurological structures are impacted by that change uh, in, in volume, if you will. So uh, very quickly we'll see those signs and symptoms, but as I alluded to earlier, the brain is very, very good. The body is very good at hiding those initial signs and symptoms of rising intracranial pressure. So pressure inside the cranial compartment, but the body has compensatory mechanism, mechanisms that help maintain that rise in uh, that intracranial pressure uh, within one millimeter of mercury. So even though you have bleeding or swelling starting to take up the compartment, the volume inside the compartment, the body is very, very good at changing things around and compensating for that to keep the intracranial pressure to within one millimeter of mercury. So you can see that even though we have those changes taking place, uh, we have injury inside the brain. The brain's very good at hiding it from us. We're not going to be very sensitive to a rise of one millimeter of, of mercury inside the brain. It's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, for us to see that. But as the intracranial pressure continues to rise secondary to sweep, uh, cerebral hematoma or swelling, that's when we start to see an increase in the number of signs and symptoms uh, especially if we're tuned into looking for those, which can lead to herniation, brain infarction, and, ver and various other uh, injury scenarios. And, and these are the types of things that what we're talking about here is three different phases of intracranial pressure. We have phase one, phase two, and phase three. If we recognize the signs and symptoms of intracranial pressure change in phase one, we can get that individual to the hospital in time where the likelihood is they'll be treated probably more with medication than anything else, released from the hospital and no harm, no foul. If we get late phase one into phase two and, and progress through phase two and certainly into phase three, each time we progress out of phase one, then the opportunity for these individuals to recover from that accident drop dramatically, especially when we start to reach mid phase two uh, and certainly at the end of phase two, phase three. These are the individuals that we read about in the paper that demonstrated very simple signs and symptoms of concussion, but all of a sudden went unconscious uh, or had really serious signs and symptoms onset 
activate 911, and these are the individuals that don't make it to the hospital or die shortly thereafter being received in the hospital. Uh, and that's what we're trying to avoid. So again, the body is very good at accommodating for those rising or changing uh, changes in intracranial pressure. Initial increases in intracranial pressure may be undetectable, uh, especially with our normal sideline assessment, that being the SCAT form and our usual cranial nerve assessment guides and those types of things are not sensitive enough on their own uh, to, to pick up on this change. Our, our normal intracranial pressure inside the, inside the cranial compartment is going to be 17, uh, excuse me, 7 to 15 millimeters of mercury, but it could be, normal could be up to 25 millimeters of mercury. So you can see even if it was normal, we have 7 to 15, but that could go up to 25 before we're able to uh, nor uh, see those uh, signs and symptoms of intracranial pressure change. And we have to keep in mind too that even though that along with the brain being very good at accommodating for those changes in intracranial pressure, our younger athletes in particular have a higher tolerance for intracranial pressure changes. So younger kids are going to be even more, or, or excuse me, even better at hiding intracranial pressure changes than older kids uh, and young adults uh, or adults. So that's important because normally we talk when we talk about concussion management, we talk about modifying conditions that can make somebody more susceptible to concussions or post-concussion syndrome or set them up for protracted recovery. And one of those things is age. Younger athletes we know present with um, more, uh, a greater number of signs and symptoms of concussion. And generally speaking, the symptom severity scores of younger individuals are also higher. Well, here we have, again, younger athletes the a modifying condition here is that the younger athletes have a better uh, way or are more efficient at hiding intracranial pressure changes. So this is just more evidence that with our younger athletes uh, in particular, we want to be, we want to have an even more conservative approach to management of those individuals. And by the way, the, the literature is fairly clear uh, in terms of defining a young athlete, which is quite interesting. Uh, because we would think of that as being youth athletics when in fact all the way up through high school 18 years and younger are considered youth uh, or uh, young athletes as far as the literature is concerned on uh, traumatic brain injury. So the problem then becomes after we have injury to the brain we we have the incorporation or the onset of a very a vicious, a vicious cycle and that vicious cycle results from injury to the brain that results in either swelling of the brain or the onset of bleeding, which takes up volume inside of the cranial compartment. And as we discussed uh, a few slides ago, we don't have any room. We don't have extra volume inside the cranial compartment to house that in increase in blood or the swelling uh, resulting from injury. So what ends up happening is we have a decrease in cerebral blood flow and that cerebral blood flow then results in an increase in blood pressure because the body's response, if the, blood, if the brain is not receiving enough blood, then the body's response is to increase blood pressure in order to get more blood into the brain. Well, you can see how that automatically causes a problem, particularly if there is bleeding inside the brain, if we have a hematoma developing, rising a rise in blood pressure is only going to facilitate the bleed. So we have facilitation of the bleed, which causes an increase in pressure inside the head, uh, which decreases cerebral blood flow. The body's response again then is to increase blood pressure, which facilitates the bleed even more, and on and on and on. We have this vicious, vicious cycle. Uh, and this is primarily instituted um, when we start to overcome the body's ability to accommodate for rising intracranial pressure. And that generally happens when mean arterial pressure is met by the intracranial pressure inside, inside the cranium. So when intracranial pressure meets mean arterial pressure, then we have a decrease in uh, cerebral blood flow, which facilitates this cycle.
Now, one of the things that you'll find in your material section is a paper that I, uh, I put together that goes along with um, this program. And that's in your material section for you to read. And this is uh, basically a review of, of this webinar. A sideline assessment strategy that uses vital signs trending as a mechanism for identification of intracranial hematoma resulting from sports, uh, head trauma and sports. So if uh, I'm not doing an adequate job or if you would like more information on the compensatory mechanism and this vicious cycle that we're describing here, uh, the paper does a real good job of outlining that for you. Okay, so if you want to read up a little bit more on that, that uh, is, is a great um, reference for you to do so. So we have compensatory failure as a result of that vicious cycle, or uh, we have the vicious cycle causing a compensatory failure, one or the other. We have an increase in the number of or the severity of typical concussion signs and symptoms including changes in cranial nerves, bradycardia, hypotension, hypertension, respiratory depression, systemic vasoconstriction, altered mental status, hyperventilation, sluggish dilated pupils, and very important to us, especially in the phase one of this compensatory failure, is the widened pulse pressure. If that swelling or that hematoma is allowed to continue and we get late phase one, phase two, and certainly into phase three, we can have a growing mass effect, um, which results in a midline shift. So the growing mass effect resulting in the midline shift can result over time. Again, that's why we are very cautious and we watch athletes over a period of time. And even though they may appear fine during our sideline assessment, we always issue that head injury warning sheet to give people that are responsible for the athlete signs and symptoms to watch out for over the course of time because we know that the signs and symptoms may not be present at the moment indicative of a hematoma or or, um, or swelling inside the cranial cavity but those may result over time due to a growing mass effect we could also have a traumatic a immediate onset from the trauma resulting in brain herniation, brain stem compression, or infarct. So all of this is relative to the rise in intracranial pressure and the onset of mechanisms that override our compensatory ability to accommodate for that. These are life-threatening signs and symptoms that in, um, are indicative of the need to transport, transport somebody immediately. But we can also have the gradual onsets uh, of those signs and symptoms. And these signs and symptoms, as you know, just from our title today, differential diagnosis can mimic signs and symptoms of concussion, but there are important subtle differences if we know where to look and how to look for those. And that's what we wanna start to focus in on. So we wanna look at signs and symptoms, and really it's, it's our traditional signs and symptoms of concussion, but we're looking at them a little bit differently. Uh, we're going to use the signs and symptoms of concussion to be indicative of a concussion for sure, but we're also going to look at them a little bit differently in terms of helping us differentiate between concussion and hematoma. Uh, heart rate, certainly I mentioned the wide, the widened pulse pressure interval, so we're going to look at heart rate and blood pressure together, not just if the heart rate is abnormal, but if we look at heart rate and blood pressure in combination with each other, what is it telling us about the possibility of intracranial pressure? And if we know what to look for, and we can combine that with what's going on in terms of resp respiratory rates, we can see that there are classic signs and symptoms of rising intracranial pressure that we can see very, very early and get those athletes to the hospital immediately. So how do we do that? <clears throat> First thing we're gonna look for and, and note in our normal concussion management uh, signs and symptoms checklist is that we're going to look for an increase in the number or an increase in the severity of signs and symptoms of a concussion. Because as we know of concussion, a concussion is going to present with certain signs and symptoms, but in short order, 
those signs and symptoms are gonna to start to resolve. Uh, and they're certainly not gonna get worse over time. That would be, although it is possible to present that way, it is too indicative of, of a hematoma to uh, ignore that and to decide on our own that that is uh, a concussion. So we're looking for the classic signs and symptoms of concussion. Those being the onset of some sort of battery uh, or some sort of clinical presentation of classic signs and symptoms of concussion that either remain the same or resolve in fairly short order over the course of um, serial measurements or serial assessments. An increase in the number or an increase in the severity of signs and symptoms of concussion is not a concussion. That is too indicative of hematoma, rising intracranial pressure, secondary to, tra to, to traumatic brain injury. And we just can't, we can't ignore that possibility. So we're gonna use our SCAT and the symptom index that's on the SCAT form, as well as the symptom severity score. So as I said, we're gonna be looking specifically at concussion signs and symptoms, but not the SCAT form together uh, all on its own. We're gonna be trending the SCAT form over a period of time, and I'll show you that here momentarily. We're also going to be trained. Uh, we're going to be making serial measurements and trending the cranial nerve survey, and we're going to be looking specifically for what we refer to as Cushing's triad over that period of time. Cushing's triad being a widened pulse pressure combined with bradycardia or a slowed heart rate and irregular respirations. So, if we see that classic presentation of Cushing's triad, that is a classic uh, indicator of rising intracranial pressure. So if we use the sports medicine concepts, mild traumatic brain injury, uh, vital signs trending report, which I'm gonna to show to you here in a, in a minute, that allows us to screen for a, the immediate need to transport the athlete, okay? And by in, in doing so, it's because on that trending report, we are looking at, at a series of signs and symptoms, including um, those that we find by implementing the SCAT form. But what's really nice, if, if you don't have the SCAT-5 yet, I, I, I really recommend that you go out and, and get the SCAT-5 and start implementing the SCAT-5. Upgrades uh, to the SCAT-5 are, are great in terms of adding many, many features to that uh, battery of tests, that clinical battery of tests. One that I really like is providing clinical criteria for deciding whether something is a medical emergency or, or not. Uh, our, traumatic brain injury report takes it one step further, and I'm gonna show that to you. So we're gonna, we're gonna implement the SCAT or cri clinical criteria for immediate need to transport the athlete versus it's safe to bring the athlete to the sideline for further evaluation. We're gonna remove the athlete from the conflicting environment. Um, I, I have become a big fan of what I've learned from many paramedics and EMTs that I've worked with throughout the years across the country in that they're, one of their main priorities in an acute accident or acute injury situation is to get a patient from what they can call the confusing environment and into a more, um, a more stable environment. So get them out of, the, out of the conflicting environment and into a stable environment where we can do a better uh, assessment. And then we're gonna use our vital signs trending assessment report to trend at five minute intervals for 30 minutes. And we're gonna trend signs and symptoms that we find on the SCAT-5. We're gonna trend cranial nerves and we're gonna trend vital signs looking specifically at pulse pressure and pulse ox uh, and the widened pulse pressure interval. So let me change my screens here and I'll show you um, the vital signs trending assessment report. This also is in your materials guide as well as the cranial nerve assessment guide. So here you see that what we're gonna do is, the first thing we're gonna do is make a distinction about whether this person should be transported from the field of play because it's an obvious medical emergency situation requiring transport of the athlete. Those, those are the types of things, and without getting too far into it, that's a topic for another day, but things like prolonged unconsciousness, the inability to rule out cervical spine injury, those types of things, those obvious clinical signs and symptoms indicating the need for transport. Uh, barring the presentation of those athletes that we're allowed to get that we allowed to get up off the field and bring to the sideline for further assessment, in cases where we're not sure, 
or where we are concerned about mild traumatic brain injury, those are the individuals we're going to bring to the sideline and we're going to trend them for a period of time. Using the graph here, we'll trend them for 30 minutes at five minute intervals. And you'll see here what we're looking for. You'll see the first thing on the left hand column as far as signs and symptoms is the total number of scat symptoms. So I'm looking, when we do the scat test, I'm looking specifically at that area of the scat that looks at the number of signs and symptoms. And I'm going to do that every five minutes. I'm going to ask that battery of questions every five minutes. And I'm going to make note of the number of signs and symptoms that the athlete complains of. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call, I'm going to calculate the symptom severity score from the SCAT and I'm going to log that symptom severity score. So I'm looking at the number of signs and symptoms as well as the severity of signs and symptoms. I'm looking for altered mental status. So we're going to trend that. I'm going to conduct the 12 cranial nerve assessment guide, which I have in your material section if, you, if you've forgotten your 12 cranial nerves. Um, I have many, many poems that I could share with you, some I could share, some you'd have to share uh, in another setting. But you, you, I'm sure you have those poems that will help you re remember the 12 cranial nerves. If not, I've got the 12 of uh, the cranial nerve assessment guide for you in the materials section. We're going to look at respiration rates and we're going to trend that five minutes over 30 minutes. Heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, pulse ox, and we're going to calculate pulse pressure. And we're going to trend those over 30 minutes. Uh, switching back screens. As I alluded to, we're going to place the total number of SCAT symptoms and we're going to calculate that symptom severity score. We're going to complete our 12 cranial nerves, put that in there. And what we're looking for specifically in this trending period is an increase in the number of signs and symptoms, an increase in the severity of signs and symptoms, so a rise in the symptom severity score, an increase in the number of abnormal cranial nerve findings. And then we're going to look specifically at those vital signs that we have listed here. And in particular, of course, we're looking for changes in blood pressure and heart rate and pulse ox. Okay, but specifically what we're looking for is we every time we take a pulse measurement or a, a pulse measurement, blood pressure and SpO2, we're looking to calculate the pulse pressure interval. Now, normally a pulse pressure is going to, the pulse pressure is the difference between your systolic and diastolic. So normal blood pressure is going to be about 120 over 70. So we take 120, subtract 70, and our pulse pressure normally is about 50 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so as we take the pulse, as we take blood pressure, we're looking for changes that uh, have a widened pulse pressure effect. In other words, our systolic starts to fall and our diastolic starts to rise would increase the pulse pressure. Okay, so anything that makes that interval between the systolic and the diastolic rise, especially over time, is indicative of rising heart uh, intracranial pressure, especially if we combine that with bradycardia. And even more so, according to Cushing's triad, if we have a widened pulse pressure, with a slowed heart rate in conjunction with respiratory irregularities. That's a classic sign of early onset rising intracranial pressure. So you can see that it's important to monitor our vital signs, but we're monitoring vital signs not because we need to pass this information on the EMS when they come, but we're looking at specific ways of assessing the vital signs, not just, not just documenting them, but actually using them as an assessment tool. Pulse ox, we want to see that pulse oximeter read uh, 97 to 100 pretty consistently. If we see pulse ox starting to drop, then we know there is a problem with uh, blood flow. We know there's a problem with oxygen delivery, and that's going to be, that is not indicative of a concussion. That's not what we're used to seeing. That's more indicative of significant internal trauma. So a kid that we bring off the field, bring him to the sideline. We don't allow him to return to play, 
but we're still concerned over what is the best course of action to take for him. We're going to trend that individual over 30 minutes at five minute intervals looking for rising intracranial pressure. Persistent heart rate elevations above 100 beats per minute. Uh, consistent hypotension, consistent hypertension, and as I've alluded to before, specific to rising intracranial pressure, bradycardia combined with abnormal respirations, uh, which would be indicative of just respiratory rate, but also as using the pulse oximeter, we could have what we believe to be respirations in normal range within normal limits, but if we see that pulse oximeter starting to drop below 97, especially over serial measurements, that's going to be that's going to be indicative of uh, respiratory problems, the inability of the body to provide oxygen. Pulse pressure above 100 millimeters of mercury is certainly indicative of uh, intracranial pressure change. Okay, so as I alluded to, we have uh, in your material section, we have a number of um, things that I would like to, to point out to you. The cranial nerve assessment guide obviously is there for you. Oh, I'm not gonna download it because I have it, but you can just click on that link in your material section and the cranial nerve assessment guide will be in a downloadable format for you. It's just a, a PDF. So again, if you've forgotten um, that, um, the cranial nerve assessment guide is there for you. Uh, there's a link to um, the enhanced vital signs trending report. And that is the one uh, that we reviewed here just momentarily. Okay, so uh, I'll tell you that the vital signs trending report, which I have here for you, th this one is specific to concussion management. I have multiple uh, vital signs trending reports that I use that are very specific for internal trauma and other types of injuries because that the concept of trending over serial measurements over time is, is very, very important to us as athletic trainers determining in the acute injury setting if an injury warrants transport to the emergency room or if this is something that can wait for a follow-up evaluation. And be it head injury, be it uh, pneumothorax or other types of internal injuries, shock, um, hypoglycemia, whatever, the, the trick to the vital signs trending report is very simple. You'll see that all of the vital signs trending reports that, that we have will have all of the vital signs on there. The only difference is how you um, assess those vital signs. For example, here during our conversation, we were talking what are changes in the vital signs that are indicative of rising intracranial pressure? You could ask yourself the same question for pneumothorax, for shock, for hypoglycemia, for whatever, ever, whatever condition you might be concerned about. What are the changes in vital signs that result from the onset of that condition? And that's what you are looking for as you trend those vital signs over time. Okay, and you'll see that we made this one very specific to traumatic brain injury by including the SCAT, uh, symptoms as well as the symptom severity score. Um, again, if it, depending on the injury situation that you're looking for, we change those signs and symptoms out with other signs and symptoms that are more indicative of that type of injury that you are writing this um, trending report up for. So uh, I know we spoke specifically about hematoma versus concussion uh, with this one, but you can see that the, the concept of vital signs trending can be and, and this report can be manipulated for just about any type of trauma or internal injury scenario. So I strongly urge you to use vital signs trending as part of your on-field assessment. Uh, going down through some of the, uh, I have the hematoma versus concussion. <clears throat> I have that report for you, that, that um, document that was written up that provides a real good overview of, of what we've discussed during this program. I also have some other uh, links in there that I'll let you uh, look at on your own. Uh, I did upload the SCAT-5 evaluation packet for you. So if you're not currently using the SCAT-5 or not familiar with the SCAT-5, 
I have that for you as well as the write-up for it, so with the instructions and those types of things on, on the SCAT 5. Okay, so I want to remind you, uh, as, as I'm going through the next couple of slides here, please feel free. We do have a little bit of time uh, left over. Uh, I usually um, a lot about an hour for, for these sessions, and some of that last minute uh, or remaining time I like to leave open for any questions that might come up. So as I'm going over these, these last concluding slides, if you have something that you'd like to type into the chat section, we certainly have time to address those questions, uh, and, and we'll do so as, as time permits. Those that we don't get to, uh, I will certainly, again, record those in the chat log and make sure we get appropriate answers to you. Uh, one thing I want to do before we close out is remind you that, again, our sports emergency care white paper sessions run the last Monday of every month from 1 to 2 o'clock Eastern time save for holiday seasons, which uh, might change things up a little bit. So just watch the Sports Emergency Care white paper session uh, schedule on our website and keep abreast with things by following us on our Facebook, Twitter, and on our website blog. Uh, you'll certainly get up-to-date information from those sources. Monday, October 30th, we'll look at liability. And I'm, I'm, very, in I'm, I'm very excited about this topic. This was something that came directly out of our experiences uh, training over this past summer, uh, where we get a lot of lot of questions pertaining to the position statement, talking about management of the equipment laden athlete, and many of the questions that have, that have come out of that document, uh, and in particular, a lot of concern over liability, whether they don't if liability concerns surrounding whether they make various decisions on the field that don't necessarily follow exactly what the position statement says. Um, so reconciling current equipment removal guidelines and the American Heart Association chain of survival. So we're going to look specifically at th that topic and reflect on the possibility of liability and where liability falls into that argument. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. We're, we're still in the midst of researching a lot of, a lot of that uh, and putting that program together for you. But uh, I'm very excited to, to, to have that offered up for next, next month. A reminder that uh, we just completed last week our Concussion Management Specialist Fall Edition, and we have the Concussion Management Specialist Winter Online Session, which begins Monday, December 11th, and will run through Thursday, December 14th. Uh, that provides 15 evidence-based practice CEUs just before the end of the BOC reporting period. So if you're looking for evidence-based practice CEUs, We'll get them all to you in that short order. You can learn more and register on our website, of course. And as we close out, I want to thank you for attending. I know that you have many CEU opportunities available to you. I hope that you find our sports emergency care white paper sessions to be a convenient way to get some CEUs, uh, but also that they're point they're they're spot on in terms of providing information that is uh, immediately relevant to you in the field of play on the court uh, and that can be useful for you later on this afternoon. Um, combining our expert opinion with systematic review of the literature and uh, clinical experiences. Your follow-up email after we close out this session will have your evaluation link. As I said earlier in the, se in the session, please take a, uh, a minute to complete that evaluation. There will also be links to today's material a link to the next session if you would like to join us for that uh, liability discussion. Your CE document will be provided to you in a personalized email that will come after completion of the course evaluation. With that, I bid you a good day and an injury-free day and look forward to seeing you next month at the Sports Emergency Care White Paper Webinar Series. Thank you. <laughs>